Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, don't worry, not far till lunch now. Right, this is a very simple picture of pterosaur evolution. Left-hand side at the top, you see what we used to call Ramphorhynchoids, a paraphletic group of mostly long-tailed pterosaurs, which will always be de depicted in red. Bottom right, you see a much larger group, a real clade, pterodactyloids with their classically short tails. In terms of pterosaur evolution, uh, there's a major radiation sometime in the mid to late Triassic. Uh, where they come from, we don't know, and the one person who does is not here. Um, there is a second radiation in the mid to late Jurassic, which of course is the origin radiation of pterodactyloids. This is a very important evolutionary event because pterodactyloids went on to dominate aerial environments in the Cretaceous, as my colleagues have alluded to in their talks as well. However, until 2009, we had no idea how basal pterosaurs transformed into pterodactyloids, which was rather frustrating. Happily, along came, oops, sorry, let's go back. Along came Darwinopterus uh, from the uh, earliest Upper Jurassic Tiaojishan formation of Liaoning in China. And this uh, very neatly sat both in the temporal, temporal and phylogenetic gap between basal pterosaurs and pterodactyloids, which is very pleasing. And it actually forms a clade with pterodactyloids called monophenostrata, and typified by, for example, the uh, confluent nasal and antorbital openings. The interesting thing about Darwinopterus is that the skull and the neck are identical to those of pterodactyloids, whereas the rest of the postcranial skeleton is virtually identical to that of basal pterosaurs. So this tells us something very important about timing. The skull and the neck evolved first. The rest of the skeleton caught up later on. Um, the problem is that there are no real intermediate characters, or at least there didn't appear to be, in Darwinopterus. You either had pterodactyloid characters or you had basal pterosaur characters. And what that meant was we didn't really gain much idea of the actual transformation of anatomy from the basal form to pterodactyloids from Darwinopterus. What we really needed was forms intermediate between the basal pterosaur and Darwinopterus, or between Darwinopterus and pterodactyloids. Ideally both. I'm very pleased to report that's what we now have. And I'm going to rip through these really, really quickly. We have things like Olcarum from the early uh, Middle Jurassic of Argentina. There's a whole bone bed of the stuff down there. It just takes a long time to prepare. We have some fragments of something very like Darwinopterus in the middle mid-Jurassic Stonesfield slate. We have lots of Darwinopterus, probably more than 100 specimens out there. And so eventually we're going to have a really good detailed knowledge of the skeletal anatomy of that pterosaur. From the same deposits as Darwinopterus, which is early, earliest Upper Jurassic, we have this thing called Daujanopterus, which is more derived than Darwinopterus, but still not a pterodactyloid. Again, in the same deposit, so early Upper Jurassic, we even have this thing called Liaodactylus, described earlier this year by Jowetel. That does seem to be a pterodactyloid. It seems to nest inside Catina chasmatoids, but we only have the skull, and we know from Darwinopterus that when you only have the skull, you can get pretty strange phylogenetic results. We also have some very fragmentary remains of a thing called Cryptodracon from coeval deposits of Xinjiang in China. Uh, that also, I think, is something very close related to Darwinopterus. We have Cuspicephalus, which is also related to Darwinopterus, but a bit more derived, collected by Steve. Are you here today, Steve? No. Oh, no, Steve. That's very sad. Wonderful, wonderful find from Steve. Uh, this is a bit younger. It's uh, mid-upper Jurassic. It's Kimmeridge clay. Finally, we have Ramphodactylus from the Python formation, which just underlies the Solnhof and limestone, so that's late upper Jurassic. And this is a highly derived uh, form, but it's not quite a pterodactyloid. What we need is a phylogenetic analysis to sort of round all these things up. This is uh, what you're seeing here is part of a much larger analysis. Do not try to read the taxa on here. Only worry about the colors. Here's basal forms in a kind of red, and here's pterodactyloids in a kind of blue. So all those things you were looking at are nearly all of them. A magnificent seven, 
fall out as monofenestratins, but they're basal monofenestratins. Technically, we should call them non-pterodactyloid monofenestratins. It's a dreadful mouthful, so I'm going to call them uh, basal monos for the rest of this talk. So that's our basal monos. And interestingly, Laodactylus, that thing that we think is a pterodactyloid from the Chiaojisan, does fall out as a pterodactyloid here, but bear in mind the caveats. Phylogen is always a bit boring, isn't it? What you really want to see is what does this look like when it's set in a temporal framework? So all the yellow forms are our magnificent seven basal monofenestratins. The important points here are, first of all, that that paraphyletic group, admittedly, actually spans quite a bit of time through the middle and late Jurassic. They're actually quite diverse. I'm not going to go into that today, but um, the other important thing is they add quite a bit to our, the known diversity of pterosaurs in the mid to late Jurassic. Critically, and I apologise for the fact this particular diagram doesn't show it very well, things like um, all Karuan, which are actually older than Darwinopterus, actually generally map out rather earlier in the phylogenetic tree. That's great. Things like Dagenopterus and Ramphodactylus are stratigraphically either of similar age or younger, and they are actually more derived than Darwinopterus and fall out much nearer pterodactyloids. What that means is we now have basal monofenestratins that actually span some of that gap between basal pterosaurs and pterodactyloids. So what does that actually tell us in terms of transformations? Well, if we look at the skull, here's a basal skull, there's a derived skull pterodactyloid at the bottom. Interestingly, Darwinopterus is clearly very tact pterodactyloid. You would think that was a pterodactyloid. That's where it falls out in cladograms when you only run the skull. Our other basal monofenestratins that actually have skulls also seem to compare pretty well with Darwinopterus, or they're even more pterodactyloid-like. So you'd be quite forgiven for thinking that a typical pterodactyloid-like skull is actually plesiomorphic for the whole of monofenestrata and appears really early on, probably in the early Jurassic, or maybe even earlier. However, all Karuan, this thing from Argentina, which is our oldest basal mono, while it has a brain case that certainly is pterodactyloid in many respects, as you can see in this reconstruction down here of the actual gross morphology of the brain, when we look at the lower jaw, the mandibles, in lateral view, the lower one there, actually that compares quite well with the lower jaws of really basal pterosaurs. So all Karuan doesn't actually quite fit that they've got pterodactyloid skull story for monofenestratins. There seems to be a degree of mosaic evolution creeping in here. Meanwhile, amongst the neck vertebrae, all those basal monofenestratins where the necks preserved seem to have vertebrae that are absolutely identical to those of typical pterodactyloids. So this particular feature certainly is plesiomorphic for monofenestrata and probably appears really early, possibly correlated with that early appearance of the apparently pterodactyloid skull. At the other end of the spinal column, things are much more complicated. Here's Darwinopterus, has a classic long tail just like basal forms. Here's Daujanopterus, this is a somewhat more derived basal monofenestratin from the same deposit as Darwinopterus. Look at the tail there, sorry I don't think I've got a pointer on here, you can figure it out. It's that relatively reduced structure, that's very interesting, that's a really cool piece of sort of anatomy in transformation if you want to see it that way. Finally, this derived basal monofenestratin, Ramphodactylus from the Upper Jurassic, look at the tail on this thing here, this is almost a pterodactyloid tail, not quite, not quite short enough, but there we go. So the story with tails, and sorry, I'm putting enough pictures on here, is it's actually rather complicated because within basal monofenestratins, we've got a whole range of different kinds of tails, and they don't actually sort themselves neatly on the cladogram. I apologise, I don't have a clear cladogram for that. Uh, but we do, by the time we reach things like Ramphodactylus, we do seem to have achieved that grade of tail that we might call pterodactyloid or near pterodactyloid. But you'll no notice that's completely out of step with what's going on with the cervical vertebrae. What about out in the limbs then? The metacarpus, here's a classic feature. 
the relative length of the metacarpus compared to the humerus has often been used to distinguish basal pterosaurs from pterodactyloids. So basal forms, typically, it's somewhere between about 25 and 70%-ish of humerus length. In pterodactyloids, it's generally at least 80% of humerus length and usually an awful lot longer than the humerus. So where do our Magnificent Seven fit here? Here's the ones we've got uh, sufficient material for us to calculate that. Well, interestingly, nearly all basal monofenestratans actually fall within the range for basal pterosaurs, calculated in that very simple way of just compare the length of the metacarpus with the humerus. The one exception is Cryptodracon, which actually seems to fall between the two. But Cryptodracon is on the bottom left here. There's a problem because the humerus is incomplete in that specimen. So the value is not really that reliable here. I would also point out that if we look at this a somewhat different way and calculate, for example, the slenderness of the wing metacarpal, what we then find is that basal monofenestratans actually fall between basal pterosaurs and pterodactyloids. But I haven't finished that work yet, so you can't see it. Finally, right at the end of the foot there, pedal digit five, our little toe. Well, in basal pterosaurs, they have these two very elongate phalanges, as you see on the, the white arrow pointing it out here on the left. In Dargenopterus, same, uh, same age as Darwinopterus, Sorry, it's not very clear, but the white arrow points out there's a very small fifth toe here, but it's still got two phalanges in it. And in this beautiful UV picture by uh, Helmut Tischlinger, you can see again the fifth toe, white arrow there, uh, still has two very small phalanges in there, although they're very reduced. Pterodactyloids have a single really, really short phalange in there. So none of our basal monofenestratons that we know about actually achieve the pterodactyloid condition, but they're clearly going in that direction. Right, can we summarize all this in a single diagram? Well, I've tried. Okay, so what I did was I chose eight sort of key aspects of uh, this transformation, four in the cranium, four in the postcranium. I've assign them very simplistically to either a basal pterosaur state, an intermediate one, or a pterodactyloid state. And I've arranged, in this case, I've arranged them temporally in a stratigraphic sequence. Could have done it phylogenetically, just didn't have time to squeeze it in the talk. But we've got the lower Jurassic at the bottom, obviously, and the late upper Jurassic at the top. You will not be surprised to discover that basal pterosaurs like Dimorphodon show all the basal pterosaur states whereas derived forms like pterodactylus show all the typical pterodactyloid states. So the big reveal, I guess, is what happens when we add in all our basal monofenestratans. And the first point to make here really is, yeah, it's confusing. I spent quite a lot of time looking at this diagram thinking, oh, bloody hell, what's going on here then? Um, First message is that really sort of simple modular model that we saw when we only had Darwinopterus. I'm afraid it rather blows that one up. So we are largely abandoning that simple modular idea. Although I think modularization still has an important role to play, but it's at a much more exclusive level, sort of the kind of individual structures we're looking at here, like the toe or the tail or what have you. Let's focus in on the skull and the cervicals. It does appear that they um, originate quite early on. We're sort of talking about lower Jurassic. Thank you very much, Emily. It's all right. I'll just go over Paul's talk. He won't mind. Um, <laughs> so the skull and the, and the cervicoverci, the typical sort of pterodactyloid morphology, appears quite early on. But what we've learned is that in some cases, some aspects of that morphology isn't the sort of pterodactyloid state that we'd expect. So there is some sort of mosaic evolution going on there. When it comes to the postcranium beyond the cervicals, well, things are a really quite unholy mess, basically. The key point here is that we do actually capture some anatomical transformation, which is great. The second key point is there isn't much correlation between the transformations that are going on. So different things are happening at different times to different structures. The fifth toe, the tail, the metacarpus, they're all sort of following their own transformation trajectories without really paying a lot of attention to what other structures are doing. 
what that means is that simple explanations for, how you, for why pterodactyloids might have evolved their particular and very specific bow plan I don't think will work. We can't just sort of say, well, I think it's something to do with flight. They're just adapting to us a different kind of flight style. No, that's never going to work at all. A more generalized point, there's quite a lot of gaps here. So we're missing data, uh, which could have a big influence on how we interpret these things finally. And I'll just make a, a very bold prediction. Maybe this Leodactylus, which we think is a pterodactyloid, is actually the skull that belongs to Diagenopterus, which is a basal monophenostratum. What does it look like phylogenetically? Well, put very, very simply, we can now begin to reconstruct the evolution of the pterodactyloid bow plan. It's spread over quite a large period of time and it's spread over quite a lot of taxa, which before we found Darwinopterus is probably what we would have predicted. So I think we can take comfort from that. There are still lots of important fossils that I think are going to appear over the next few years and they're going to tell us a lot more about what's going on. And I'd point out that most of these magnificent seven basal monophenostratons have yet to be studied in detail. So I think there's still a lot more to come on the sort of origin and evolution of the pterodactyloid bow plan. Emily's about to throw me off the stage, so I just wanted to say thank you very much to lots of people, in particular IVPP Beijing and uh, Mall, uh, Pimol in Shenyang, who were very kind this year and allowed myself and Jordan into their collections and supported us. And I always like to get a little personal note in. It turns out I am not the worst sailor in my family. Thank you very much. <laughs>